So this summer, I finally had the once in a lifetime chance to fly to Dutch Harbor, but not just on any old airplane, a 1942 Grumman Widgeon. But that aside, what makes this trip so special is that we got to follow my grandfather's wartime flight path through some of Alaska's rugged yet absolutely breathtaking terrain and landed on the very same runway that my grandfather crashed at 81 years ago. That crash saved his life. This was a trip I had been waiting for. But it wasn't all fun and games. On the second day of our flight, we got to experience what the Aleutian Flyers had to put up with when flying in one of the most dangerous places in the world. This flight is not for the faint at heart. Today is gonna be a good day. Okay, so what is so exciting that we're doing today? Today, we're flying to Dutch Harbor on a widgeon. Widgeon, for those of you who don't know, is an um, amphibious plane. It can land on water and on the land. They had them here during the war, mostly like as liaison planes. I mean, a widgeon is super cool and exciting, but what's cool about it is small plane all the way to Dutch Harbor, same airfield, same route that my grandfather did 81 years ago, almost 81 years ago. Super exciting. One of the reasons why I decided to come to Anchorage this summer, other than to finish this little uh, National Park Service project I've been working on. The weather's looking decent. We might get held up along the way. So we were told to pack a sleeping bag, no problem. Vision holds. I think Burke said six people, so there's, I think, four of us going. So right now I'm just heading across into downtown to the favorite bakery here called uh, Fire Island. I'm gonna get us all some cookies for the trip. I'm so excited. Okay, I got the goods. Fire Island. This should break up the trip. This should take about six or so hours. We're leaving between four and five, hopefully. It's surprisingly sunny in Dutch Harbor, but it's in route. That is still questionable. I know we're trying to beat some weather, so hopefully we make it. Cool. One of the highlights, F-22s. Um, they usually take off at least a couple times a day. Um, Elmendorf Air Force Base, which uh, started during the war, is still here and home to Alaska NORAD. Our Widgeon, 1942. Yes, he's flown this to Dutch Harbor before. So we're trying to get out of here. There is a low that's coming in. But so far the passes look good. And we're gonna do a lake takeoff. And I'll wait.
take a look inside. I have not been inside yet. Perfect. You have stuff packed in the nose and packed in the tail. And here comes our pilot. Hi, Burke. Hey, Jerry. <laughs> the adventure about to start here. Yes, I love it. How's it look? It's good. It's a little lower between here and King Salmon. Okay, so this is it. We are packed and ready to go. We just have to pick someone up at the airport who's just coming in on a jet. And it's our turn. You gotta be on your toes when you fly in Alaska. The areas around the Anchorage airport have some of the most congested airspace in all of North America. There are float planes taken off from the lake, Lake Hood. There are wheel planes taken off from an adjacent strip. There are commercial and cargo jets taking off from the international airport. And then just north of the airport is military airspace. So you have F-22s and other military cargo planes and refueling planes coming and going. And not to mention that there's a regional airport in the middle of downtown Anchorage called Merrill Field. You gotta know what you're doing when you fly out here. And that's almost like the complete opposite of how it was during the war. Early on, the airspace around Anchorage was severely lacking in radio communication, navigational aids, sufficient maps, and it was actually the war that helped accelerate Alaska's development, resulting in the busy airspace that we see now. We took off to the northeast from Lake Hood Float Plane Base, which is located pretty much beside the Anchorage International Airport. It is the largest and busiest float plane base in the world. It's super cool to see, so if you're ever visiting the Anchorage area, there's a self-guided walking tour that you can take, and I highly recommend it. To walk the entire lake is about four and a half miles. So we flew over the Kinnick Arm and we turned southwest to set course for Lake Clark Pass, which is roughly 30 miles from Anchorage. The pass is kind of huge. It's 70 miles long and has an elevation of a thousand feet. Lake Clark Pass is pretty much the quickest way to get to the north side of the Alaska Peninsula and one of the main thoroughfares towards getting there. It's also one of the most scenic routes in all of Alaska. Passage through it is completely controlled by weather, as most things in Alaska. And although we were trying to beat some weather and also had a strong headwind, the pass was clear and relatively smooth. The views were unbelievable. Because of the elevation of the pass, the snow-capped mountains are there year round and there were tons of glaciers on both sides and the most aqua blue glacial lakes and streams that you ever saw. Our pilot Burke is a veteran Alaska aviator and he knows this route well. Burke spent years flying the Grumman Goose commercially in Dutch Harbor. Now the Grumman Goose is the older sister of the Grumman Widgeon. And if there's anyone I would want to do this trip with, it's Burke. 
and their co-pilot was Burke's close friend, Scott, who also flew commercially in Dutch Harbor. So we were in good hands. It was fun to watch them navigate the landmarks and maps, changing radio frequencies, calling out locations for other aviators in the area, which is kind of standard protocol for out there, getting weather updates and all other things pilots do to ensure an uneventful flight. In the past, we flew over the very long Lake Clark for who the pass is named. And then once out of the pass, we were on our way to Iliamna, flying over Lake Iliamna. Now Iliamna is significant to me because the day that my grandfather crashed, his squadron mate, George Swalm, also crashed. He had a total electrical failure and ended up having to bail out in Iliamna. He survived the crash and was picked up by an Alaskan commercial airline company called Star Airlines. As we approached the airfield in Naknek, which is now called King Salmon, I immediately envisioned my grandfather letting down the same way that we were, the same airspace, the same sight lines, and the same anticipation that you get with each landing. Little did he know how magnificent that crash landing would be to the rest of our family. to Naknek. So Naknek is important because my grandfather crashed his P-40 here. Uh, ground looped. He ground looped on landing. That's crashed. The plane was uh, inserviceable. He ended up on a C-47. And later on, the second leg of the flight, five of the seven crashed into a mountain. And my grandfather, because of his life-saving ground loop in Knack Knack lift. And that plane today is actually in the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. That P-40 was the very P-40 that he crashed in Knack Knack. And now I'm here. Super cool. I wouldn't be here if he had not crashed at this runway. So, that was the reason why I wanted to come to Anchorage this summer because my friend Burke said that he could fly me to Dutch Harbor and I knew that meant we were stopping in Naknek. Super great. Neck, neck. Bay. And we are up, leaving Knack Knack behind and flying along the Bering Sea side of the Alaska Peninsula, passing Vinamina Volcano. 
an 8,000 foot stratovolcano named after a very beloved Russian Orthodox priest from the 19th century. The Alaska Peninsula and the Aleutian Islands are part of the Ring of Fire and there are hundreds of volcanoes and we're about to get up close and personal with a couple of them. Meet Pavlov and Pavlov's sister volcanoes. Both of these stratovolcanoes sit around 8,000 feet, but Pavlov has been the most active volcano in the U.S. since the 1980s with at least 14 eruptions. But judging from that crater, all was quiet. And just beside Pavlov's volcanoes are Aileen's Pinnacles, these enormous jagged rock formations that stick straight up. They were absolutely beautiful. And as the sun was setting on the small town of Cold Bay, we landed to conclude round one of our epic trip to Dutch Harbor. Both Naknek and Cold Bay were bases during the war. Naknek served as more of a refueling station, an auxiliary field, very small detachment station there. Whereas Cold Bay was the largest base at the time that Dutch Harbor was attacked, as Fort Glen on Umnak, which was 80 miles southwest of Dutch Harbor, was still being developed. Because of the very long runways, Cold Bay would go on to see military service through the Vietnam War when it was finally transferred over to civilian use. 
And if you enjoyed this video, please stay tuned for day two of our epic trip to Dutch Harbor, where we get to see just how ominous and dangerous flying in the Aleutians can be. So stick around.